Well, hello and welcome back to lecture number six, where we dive deeper into statistics. And our main topic today will be continuous distributions, different types of those. And then we do some more advanced stuff like principal component analysis just for fun, because we will be working with a really cool data set um, that just lends itself to this sort of stuff. Um, before we go ahead, that's some preparation we need to need to do. So let's jump into our studio. Uh, so up here, you see my usual library tidyverse, but you also see library tidy models. So this is another set of packages that you will have to install with install packages, tidy models. And I'm not going to run, the, run this because, uh, well, I have just I have already installed this. And what tidy models is, is the extension of the tidyverse for modeling. So modeling is the, the idea of we're taking some data and we're generating insights from those. We are generating predictions from those. Um, for example, uh, things like the statistical tests we're running, they are a form of modeling, but also there's more advanced things like machine learning and, and all that fancy stuff, um, which is also modeling. Next up, we will jump into modeling, and I have this, uh, that's one of my favorite quotes, actually. Um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And what this refers to is that every model that we are creating is just a simplification of reality. You know this from, for example, physical formulas that you're writing down, and then you're doing the experiment, it's never actually the exact same thing. Right. We're just approximating reality as best as we can. but also as useful as we can. Like sometimes you don't need a very detailed model to make a prediction. You just need your model to be good enough to, to make an, a, a prediction or make a decision. And there are different types of models about which we will be talking today. So the first are merely descriptive models. And I have some, some code in here, which right now doesn't work because I haven't loaded the tidyverse just yet. So let me run this part first. Now we can run this. And these are just, that is describing the data. They are not trying to make any inf any inferences about what's happening in the future. We just, for example, this one is just a smooth line through the data. It helps us see a trend, but we, are, we can't use it to predict anything. Um, in this example, we are using GeoSmooth. Um, if you look at what GeoSmooth uses by default, this just stands for locally estimated scatterplot smoothing. So just to get a smooth line, not to make any predictions. So don't, don't see this as like a formula from which you can get new data points. But just help us see trends. The next part are inferential models. And those are there for us to make decisions, to infer things. Um, the p-values we have created last week are actually an example um, because while well, we are using a model about what we think is the null, null hypothesis, for example, to make a decision if we want to reject the null hypothesis, for example. Um, they often rely pretty heavily on assumptions about our data, um, but those will be the most likely models you will encounter when you answer research questions. And next up are predictive models. And those are designed to actually make predictions. Um, of those, we also differentiate between mechanistic models, which try to have to, in, to in include some understanding of the, say, physical phenomenon that is actually happening. So if you are fitting um, like a curve with some parameters, it's often mechanistic because we are using some physical formula, for example, that is um, that has been tested before, for example. Um, and then we are fitting this model to our data to get the parameters. And then we can use these parameters and our fitted function to make predictions. Um, as opposed to these mechanistic models, we also have empirical models, which just look at our data and try to make predictions about new data um, without really caring about any underlying physical mechanisms. So um, those include like machine learning, 
big, big deep learning networks, for example, they usually only care about making good predictions from a bunch of data um, and try to learn from those. They don't usually fit, uh, have like a physical meaning to those. And well, both of their places. And now it's uh, it's time to actually jump into our data set for today. And today's data will be song data from Spotify. So the cool thing about Spotify is they have something called an API. API stands for application interface. So while we as users, we interact with Spotify, we are the buttons and, and apps we have. Um, other programs can interact with Spotify via this application interface. So this is how different programs talk to each other. Um, and not only can other programs do that, there's also an R package called Spotify R, which can talk to this API. And we can use this to download data about songs. And what I did is I created a Spotify playlist, which um, you can find the link in the script. So you can you can listen to it while while you're analyzing the data. Sometimes nice to get a, an actual feeling of the data points that we're working with. If you want to know how I download the data, you can check out the R folder and the script get Spotify data <clears throat> does exactly that. And if you want to do this yourself, you can check out the link to the documentation of Spotify R, which explain explains very well how you can get this uh, so-called access token so you can download uh, your own data. Um, however, you don't have to because I have al already done so and I saved it in the data folder um, on 06 Spotify playlist. Uh, one note, if you downloaded the complete um, project for this course in the beginning of this course, this might be a bit outdated because um, in the meantime, I decided to add a couple of more songs um, so I ran this script again, so the data is now updated on... So when this video goes live, the data will be updated on GitHub. So if you want the latest data, <coughs> um, so it look, so then it looks like when, when I'm analyzing it, it will look the same than when you're analyzing it, um, you might want to download it again. And the reason I'm doing this is because I also want to be a bit surprised about what we're, we're finding by adding some new, some new, some new songs. Um, so... Uh, let's actually read in the data. Um, let's call it songs. And we are using read CSV here because that's the format I chose to save it in. And I want to show you another way of quickly looking at one of those data frames, which has a bunch of columns, 18 columns, bunch of data in here. Um, the glimpse function is actually quite handy for this because it sort of turns it on its side so we can see it more easily. <clears throat> so what we have here, we have the track name, we have the artist, you know, for example, first one, Africa by Toto. Um, and then we have a bunch of metrics that Spotify gives us. Um, for example, we have the danceability, how danceable is the song, we have the energy, we have the uh, the key, which is uh, for like D, C major, for example. Um, it just has a number instead of the letter. <clears throat> then we have the loudness, the mode, which is, um, the mode is going to be either a major or minor. So one would be like nine, nine, one would be the nines key, I don't actually just know what the nines one is, um, but the major version of this one and zero would be the minor version of this. Uh, for the German speaking ones is Moll and Dur. So uh, then we have measures of speechiness. So I guess rap would be a very high speechiness and other songs, for example, classical music will have a lower speechiness, I assume. Um, we have a, a bunch more measures um, and uh, this time I also included the URI. Um, so this link, if you post this, uh, if you copy this into your browser, it will open up Spotify. And then, oh, I, I shouldn't play this here because um, yeah, it's playing playing Africa by Toto now. Um, 
but I don't want to get uh, get a copyright strike or something. So um, you will have to do this yourself. All right, let's um, pick one measure and look at some distributions because this is what we are setting out to do today. And the first one I want to look at it is just the valence. And valence is a measure of how happy or sad the song is. I don't know what algorithm they used to, to measure this, but maybe we'll find out in the process. So we take the songs and we pipe it into ggplot. We can put something, let's say we just want to have this like vertically. So we just want to have a constant on the x-axis. Let's just make this empty. And on the y-axis, we want the valence. And now we have an empty plot because, well, we haven't added any geoms. And this is how the valence looks like. Well, right now it's not terribly informative because we are plotting all the points on one line and they are over plotting each other. So what are some ways we can work around this? I will leave this in the script and work on the next big, next thing down here. Next thing we want to do is actually let me copy my notes down here so I don't forget what I'm trying to do. One thing we could actually do, which I haven't, haven't done here, and this is the reason we are plotting things, is if we just had look, look at the numbers, we could of course just look at the table. It's very hard to get a feeling for the numbers. So this is why we are visualizing things. Our eyes are just way better at spotting patterns in points, for example, than they are at spotting patterns in a list of numbers. <clears throat> so now they are over plotting each other, so we can work around this using geom jitter. And what Jitter does is it takes those points and jitters them around. Um, Jitter is pretty clever in a way because it knows that because on the x-axis we have a discrete scale, so moving things on the x-axis doesn't change the meaning of each point. Um, but on the y-axis we have a continuous scale. So if we jitter on the y-axis we would change the data, which we, we don't want. Right? This would be misleading. And so geom jitter is so clever that it doesn't jitter on this continuous axis. So the points are only shifted left and right. We can make this a little bit more compact by setting the widths to something like say 0.3. And this can be helpful if you have if you have multiple categories. But right now we don't have those. So this looks pretty chaotic, but it gives us a better feeling of the distribution of data points, but we can do better. So the next step I want to show you, actually I'm, I'm, I'm lazy now and just copy and pasting. That's easier. We're just changing the geom and now we're changing it to geom histogram. And geom histogram, I believe, we only we can only give it one thing because it wants to put it turned around like this. And what geom histogram is is imagine you take this this uh, jitter plot and you turn it around ninety degrees, and then you separate it into bins, and then you count how many dots are in each bin. The width of the bins is chosen automatically, but we can also change this here. And if we choose it too little, there's basically only one, one point per bin always. And if we choose, choose it too large, it's just going to be one large bin. Sometimes it's, it's worth playing around uh, with this to just get a feeling for your data. Now we can take this idea and generalize it a bit more. And instead of having to choose a bin size, we want to approximate the density of all those points along along the axis, and we do so using geom 
density. So this is now essentially a smooth representation of the density. It is also subject to some parameters that we might want to change, like how the smoothing is performed. this so-called smoothing kernel, but we are not dealing with this today. Um, so this is nice in the sense that it's, it's independent of the bin size. And let's make it a bit more pretty. Let's make it, I think I used like midnight blue in the script. And then I used some transparency. I think this looks pretty good. Let me also run the script I'm using to set the scene before each chapter. So now it will look like it will eventually look like when you when you're looking at it on the website. So next up, we can actually go back and, and turn it turn it by 90 degrees again. And for this, let me copy this here. Instead of using geom density, I want to show you, show you geom violin. And now once again, we need to put the valence on the x on the y axis on something constant on the x axis, so that we have an x axis. So you can think of a violin plot as a mirrored density plot, um, except we can also put it vertically, which is nice because now we can combine this with the points from earlier. So we could, for example, add some jitter with the smaller widths. which means you can simultaneously get a feel for the distribution of the data points, as well as see the individual data points. There's something even cooler than just jittering points. And this comes from the GGB swarm package. package. So renf install GGB swarm, or install packages GGB swarm if you're not in a renf project. And now instead of jitter, I use ggb swarm geom quasi random. And this is really nice because it does jitter the points around, but even though it looks pretty randomly, it still keeps the shape of the distribution, which is actually really nice. Um, I think the width is a bit too much, 0 0.35. Yeah, and this is one of my favorite way ways to visualize distributions because we can see the shape, but we also see individual data points. And often distributions are just um, simplified way too much. So now we can use this idea to ask a question. Um, do songs in the major chord have a higher valence than songs in the minor chord in our dataset? And for this, I can basically just copy and paste this. And instead of just putting a constant on the x-axis, let's make this depend on the mode. And <laughs> let's make the mode a factor. And making it a factor makes sure that it's not in interpreting this as continuous data. Because uh, remember, it mode was coded as zeros and ones, but we want these to be categories, discrete values. And uh, we don't want any NAs because we can't plot those anyways. So uh, let's do filter not is NA mode and also not is NA balance. Oh, and I forgot to add the pipe here. 
so it keeps flowing. And let's add some labels here. And it looks like it's not as clear cut as you might have thought. So we do have a bit of a hump down here where there is more add minor mode, minor mode songs. Um, and we do have a more happy uh, major mode songs, but it's not as clear cut, it's still a distribution. For example, down here, these songs, um, they appear to have very low valence. Um, and they are in major code. <clears throat> Maybe we'll find out what those are later. Um, quite often people feel the need to take all this data and summarize it to some, um, to just one or two or a couple of values. Because this makes it of course easier to reason about than this whole distribution. Um, we are losing data when we're doing so, <clears throat> and it's important to be, to be aware of this. But let's um, start by creating some summary statistics. So let's take our songs and group by the mode and then summarize. So let's say we want to know the min, the valence. We want to know the max of the valence. So the minimum and maximum <clears throat> are pretty easy summary statistics. But then there's more, there's the mean. <clears throat> and we notice, interestingly, yeah, the, the valence or the major mode is a bit higher on average, but it's <laughs> not a very solid, solid evidence here. There's another measure of um, well, measure of centrality, and this is the median. So while the mean just takes all the data points, sums them up and divides them by the number of data points, what the median is, is the data point in the middle. So you take all those data points and you number them, and the one that is exactly the half number is the median. There's a shortcut to calculate the minimum and the maximum, and this is the range function. And this gives us a vector where the first element is the minimum and the last vector is, or the second vector is. Oh, yeah, and the second vector is, <coughs> is the maximum. However, in this case, it's a bit annoying because then it creates another column, right? Which. Uh, doesn't help us here. We can take this notion of the median and <clears throat> extend it a bit. If there is a data point which is exactly in the middle, which means 50% of the data is above it and 50% of the data is below it, um, the median, we can also find other data points. For example, we can find the data point for which 24% of the data is below it or 75% of the data is below it. And if we take the median and this 25th and the 50th percentile, we can create a box plot. So let's me take this part. And instead of geom violin, we want geom box plot. So in the box plot, we will always see the median as a line. We see the 25th and 75th percentile. And then we have these whiskers. <coughs> these whiskers are a bit weird because these whiskers, they are defined such that they always de um, extend 
1.5 times the size of the so-called interquartile range, which is the size of the box. So 1.5 times the box size, um, or to the lowest or highest um, data point. And if we have other data points, which are outside of this whisker range, uh, in the box plot speech, they call it outliers. And these are then plotted separately as well. <coughs> you already see the downside of box plot plots. If we didn't have this part, <coughs> um, yeah, we we are summarizing our data a lot. Um, you wouldn't you wouldn't know that it's not not very clear cut. Um, so whenever you you see you see a box plot or even more simplified version like a bar plot with an error bar. Ask yourself, um, okay, what is the sample size? How many data points are this? What does the distribution behind this look like? We can actually take this to the extreme. Um, if we talk about some other summarized measures first. So whenever, so just a side note, whenever I do these plots that show summaries, like a, a density, a violin, or a box plot, or even a bar plot, I try to also have a plot with all the data points. Um, because usually, unless you have like a lot, a lot, a lots of data points, which is very unlikely in, in our biochemical data, data world that we're living in, <clears throat> there shouldn't be a reason to not just plot the individual data points and just show them. And if people are not showing the individual data points, ask them why. I mean, th there can of course be, be valid reasons for those. Um, but often it's just people didn't think about those. Or maybe even worse, they're trying to hide something. So <clears throat> let's talk about more ways of, of summarizing things. So what we can take from here. A common way to, to represent data is with the mean and then some measure of how far the data spreads around this mean. I have actually prepared, I think, a visualization here. So the first of those measures I want to be talking about is the variance. And what I did here is I just took all the values that the valence can have and plotted them just in the order in which they appear in the data set. <clears throat> so pretty much random. Um, and I also added the mean and their distance to the mean as red lines. So what the variance says if we look at this uh, mathematical formula here, the variance of a random variable x <clears throat> is the sum of all the distances to the average squared divided by n minus 1. We can also say that the variance is the expected value of the squared deviation to the mean or of a random variable from its mean. Um, Hang on, you might say, why is there n minus one? Because normally when you have like an expected value, for example, <clears throat> like, like the mean, we are dividing by the number of data points. We are normally dividing by n. Why is it now n minus one? And well, this whole thing, um, first of all, it's called Bessel's correction. Um, but why, why is it there? So normally, um, Say you have um, you have measured a bunch of, bunch of things, and this is your whole population. Um, there's there's no more of those things in the world. You have the complete population. You have measured them all. Um, if you then want to talk about the variance of those measurements, you are actually allowed to just divide by n. But often we only have a sample of a population. So, say you're running an experiment on some cells, for example, you are only running a finite amount of experiments. You are not running a, an experiment on all the cells that exist in the world or that will ever exist. And you are not running an experiment so often that no one can ever repeat it. <laughs> um, you're always only looking at a sample of a whole population of possible values. And in these cases, when we are only looking at a sample, our goal is to estimate the true variance 
of the whole population, which we don't have. We only have a sample. And the problem is, if we just divide by n, we will always be biased in our estimation of the variance. Um, so we do this correction, and one um, sort of sort of intuitive way of, of explaining this is that what we are dividing here is, is not meant to just always be the sample size n. Um, what this represents, this n minus 1, or in the case where we have the whole population, is the decrease of freedom. Um, let me explain what, what I mean by degrees of freedom. Um, imagine you, uh, you calculate, you, you have a bunch of data points and then you calculate their mean and then you start calculating the variance. So we are summing all those up um, and then we are ready to divide by the degrees of freedom. But before you counted the last data point, if you have, say you have 100 data points in total, and you calculate the mean, um, if you know your 99 data points and the mean, you already know everything there is to know about the last data point. It is no longer free to vary. Because we already know the mean, um, it is no longer, like that last, last data point can no longer freely vary. It's already fixed. So we need to subtract one from the degrees of freedom. I hope this makes a bit more sense. So when we're talking about a sample variance uh, from which, when, when, when we're talking about a, a variance and we only have a sample and we want to estimate the population variance, we need to use this um, correction. When all we care about is this one sample and we are treating it as a population and we don't make any inferences about all other possible values there, then of course we don't need the correction. But usually we, we want to make inferences. So we divide by n minus 1. Um, next up is the standard deviation. And this is uh, used more often actually than the variance. The reason for this is um, now after calculating the variance, it's in, in, squared, in squared units. And because we are taking the differences and then we are squaring those so we don't get negative negative values, but now we take the square root of those, the square root of the variance is now our standard deviation sigma. And we can calculate those in R actually. <clears throat> Let me do this just up here. We have, we have the variance and we have the standard deviation as d for which we have functions. There's one last thing, and this is the standard error of the mean. And this is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of observations that we have. Unfortunately, there's no function in R to do this, so we just create one of cells. So it's the SD of X divided by the square root of the number of observations. Uh, why is this whole thing called standard error of the mean? Let's do a little thought experiment. Um, imagine we actually have the whole population of like whatever we are trying to measure. Um, say the, the beak lengths of penguins, for example, or the bill lengths. And our population would now be all penguins on Earth. And imagine we, we have all those. Um, and then we repeatedly take samples of size n. Now, the means of those individual samples will actually vary. So they will have their own mean. We have like a mean of means. And the standard error of the mean is actually the standard deviation of those means, which is why it's, it's a good estimate of how close we are with our mean to the actual population mean. 
how much uh, we expect um, the the mean to scatter if other people for example repeat our experiment with the same sample size so with these summary statistics in mind let's talk about a common way people visualize their data and they take take all the data points and then they calculate the mean and then one of these measures of how far the values spread around this mean um, often people use the standard error of the mean sometimes the standard deviation and then they make a bar plot where the height of the bar is the mean and then there's an error bar around it for this measure of how far the value is spread and i have a little example here about with the plot which basically contains everything i hate about about bar plots firstly notice that we are summarizing our data a bunch we are hiding a lot of the detail um, we can only see the mean and then some error bar this plot doesn't even state what type of error bar it is showing um, i also <laughs> hate it when it's these kind of dynamite plots so the error bar it's only shown on top even though it extends to the bottom but it has the same color so we can't see it and this makes it look like there's less variation downwards even when in fact there isn't um, notice also that the y-axis starts at 0.06 instead of zero now y-axis don't always have to start at zero um, but there needs to be some common baseline and this is especially important for bar plots because when we're looking at bar plots we don't perceive the actual position of like the top of the bar as the value what we are looking at as humans is the area of this whole thing so we are comparing areas and it looks like all right for for my for minor mode it's almost double the speechiness which is completely wrong it's just a, it's a very small difference in means and there's a large variation around those means so the true story is different so let's look at the distribution of those by plotting it a bit differently and then we can actually make informed comparisons so let's pipe songs into ggplot and now i want the speech speechiness on the x-axis and i want to color it by the mode actually i want to make the mode a factor so it is seen as discrete values instead of a range from zero to one Let's also change the fill. And add a geom density. Uh, right now these are overlapping. So let's make them a bit transparent. And now it's way easier to see, I think. Way nicer to compare. We see, for example, that for the major mode, there's a larger spike in the lower speechiness, and the distribution for um, the minor mode is a bit broader. We could also now add things like the mean and and stuff to this distribution, but often this always gives more information about what our data actually looks like. And then we could have gone a step further uh, as we did above um, and looked at the individual data points to make a more informed decision as, as well all right so um if you're seeing a bar plot in the wild especially those like bar plots with error bars um, that are very commonly seen ask yourselves um, are your summary statistics hiding something interesting and if it's not your bar plot but someone else's bar plot um, be even more aware of this question about the plot up here you noticed i added a fancy fancy font here saying don't do this at home and fonts can be a bit of a pain when it comes to putting them on plots and for this i want to mention two things firstly the ggplot uh, book is now up and available which is um it's uh, also available online to read for free, just like, like Alpha Data Science, for example. It's written by Hedley Wickham, Daniel Navarro, and Thomas Lynn Peterson. 
Um, well, Hadley Wickham, you know, as the original creator of ggplot. Uh, Danielle Navarro makes amazing plots and artwork with ggplot. Uh, I call you to also really check out her website. Um, there's some really, really cool generative art created with ggplot. And yeah, everything you see here is, is basically created with ggplot and it's, it's, it's amazing, um, the stuff she makes. And uh, Thomas and Peterson, he's also creating art. Um, but on top of that, he's um, he's now the the main maintainer of ggplot. So they know what they're talking about when they're writing a book about ggplot. Um, so it's um, I use it just as a, as a resource as well when when, when I'm stuck or uh, creating a plot to look up stuff. There's a pretty important and famous distribution called the normal distribution. And it is closely related to the central limit theorem about which we should talk now. So this is the shape of the normal distribution. It's uh, the classic bell curve. And this is what the, the cum cumulative probability looks like for the normal distribution. And the central limit theorem states that the sample mean of a sufficiently large number of independent random variables is approximately normally distributed. The larger the sample, the better the approximation. Now, this seems like it's not a big deal, but it, it turns out uh, this happens quite a lot. So um, a large number of independent random variables, this means we have a bunch of things that are random on their own. But if we sum those up um, and then we divide, so we, we take a mean of those things. Um, I said sum because um, a mean also usually includes taking a sum and then dividing by the bunch, the num number of things. So if we take the mean of those independent random things, we get another mean and this is then normally distributed. And a lot of times when we are talking about some values, they are actually the result of a bunch of things coming together. Um, so we, we are counting something and we are, or we are measuring something, but the underlying processes that make it random are often a bunch of independent random processes that then come together. And if we take the mean, this we often get a normal distribution. Um, we can check if something is normally distributed using the function qq norm and then qq line. So let me take some, I think we were talking about the valence earlier on. So we got the valence here and we should remove these NAs, but um, let's see if, if qq norm can handle those. All right. And let's add QQ line. Now I'm not using these a lot because, um, well, I'm using these to check things, but I'm often not showing these in, in my final report because I like how ggplot looks better. But um, so this red line here is where things would be if everything is normally distributed. So what is this thing? It's a, it's a quantile quantile plot. So we are plotting the quantiles of on the left side, on the y-axis of the sample versus the theoretical quantiles where things would be if they were normally distributed. So right here now we have some fatter tails of the distribution, um, which means it is a bit wider than normal distribution would normally be like. But in the middle, between the minus uh, one and, and first theoretical quantile, um, it's pretty normal. But uh, it, does, it does have fatter tails. Um, another thing I want to talk about is log normality. And this is very important in biology and biological data especially. So when we take the logarithm of something, due to the way that logarithms work with a multiplication and addition, is they transform multiplicative effects into additive effects. 
And in biology, we often have these signal cascades, for example, which take a signal and then they amplify it a bunch. And there's a bunch of, neg of, of multiplicative effects from different random inputs, random sources, that then end up in a single thing that we're measuring. So, and this is why um, in biology things, uh, the values we are measuring are often not just the the result of sum or mean of individual random variation, they are often the result of a multiplication of those. But if we take the logarithm of values, well, multiplications in the mathematical uh, rules of working with logarithms turn into additions. So our data that wasn't normally distributed before will look pretty normally distributed after we take the logarithm of, some, of something. Um, I don't think I have an example here, um, but I might throw one into the, the script if I find uh, one in time before uploading. So if you find your data is not normally distributed, uh, also check the logarithm and see if, if this one is maybe normally distributed, and then this will be easier to work with. <coughs> because a lot of things we are doing in statistics also rely on normality. So. Uh, next up, I want to talk about the t distribution. And this is what it looks like. So the t distribution has another um, parameter called the decrease of freedom. And the larger the decrease of freedom, um, the more it looks like a normal distribution. If we have less degrees of freedom, it gets lower in the middle and we get fatter tails. So the distribution is broader. And we're using this a lot because often things are not just perfectly normally distributed. They often do have these fatter tails um, and the t-distribution often fits quite nicely. And another place where the t-distribution pops up is when we talk about students' t-test. Now this is named after a guy who used the pseudonym um, student. So let's let's run this and then talk about what it actually, actually does. So um, I wanted to compare the valence for different modes like we did earlier. Like we looked at the different distributions, but we didn't perform a rigorous statistical test. And now from the distribution we are, we are seeing, um, oh, I, I just noticed, um, maybe we should have looked at these um, separately for the different modes. Um, because now we want to be compa comparing the distributions for the different modes. Um, but let's run the test first. So we're going to run a t-test for how the valence depends on the mode. And the data for this uh, comes from the songs data set. And now we got a Welsh two sample t-test and we got, we get of course the p-value that people so desire and we got some, we get the difference in means uh, we get the, the means for both groups. So right now, if we are after like hypothesis testing, we would say, well, this p-value is greater than our cutoff 0, 0, 005, so 0, 0, 0.005. So we would stick with the null hypothesis that these that these uh, come from the same distribution. And the true difference of, of means is not equal to 0. Uh, let's look at this a bit more visually to see what the actual null hypothesis is that the t-test is testing. So let's take our songs. So when we run this t-test up here, what it is testing is the null hypothesis that these two distributions, the samples we are getting for either mode zero or the valences we're getting and all the valences we're getting for mode one and that these come from the same distribution. So we've got these two distributions and what is now the probability to get these two distributions if those values actually just come from the same population, from the same distribution. And in this case, it's very likely to get such a distribution um, just because those distributions are very similar. So um, let me actually just create 
let's let's cheat a bit and just pretend that the valence for for one mode is higher than for the other and let's arbitrarily change this um, let's create a new data set to do this and let's call it fake songs something so we're dropping the NAs and then we are mutating the valence to be um, if else so if the condition holds we're changing it if the mode is one we want the valence to be the valence plus some some value um, let's say 0 0.3 and otherwise just the normal valence and let's take our fake data here now and plot it again now we shifted these two distributions uh, let's see what the t-test would say in this case so let's let's copy it here oh, i need to insert a new code chunk and this can sometimes be hard to spot yeah these two code chunks are actually just one line apart from each other and we want to have one empty line in between all of the paragraphs in our markdown so that they get properly separated in our output so in here we say fake songs and now we get a statistically significant result. Now there's multiple ways in which the t-test can return a statistically significant result. One is if we have a very, very large difference in means like we have here, um, it's going to be statistically significant. And the other one is if, if the distance, if, if the difference is not too large, but we have lots of data to support this difference. Um, and in this case, we have quite a bunch of data points and um, then the p-value would also be small. So this brings me to one important point. Um, a statistically significant difference does not necessarily mean um, that there is a huge effect size, like a, dif a, a distance um, in means. It can also mean that the distance is, is not very, very large. Like, let's make it a bit smaller. Let's see how far we can, we can go. Um, let's just add a little bit. Now these sim are still pretty similar and in this case we would still get a statistically significant result and this is because if we look at the fake songs um, we have 380 and 86 data points so there's a lot of data points and even though the, dif the distance here is pretty small um, there's just a lot of data to support this so we get a statistically significant result but keep in mind that this does not like this does not tell you that the distance, uh, the difference between two groups is huge. For this, you need to look at your data, plot your data, look at the dis the differences, uh, and not just look at the p-values. All right, um, the t-test makes one crucial assumption, and this is why it's called a parametric um, test. And the well, the parameter it makes an assumption about is that both our distributions are roughly normally distributed because then the t-test works properly if this is not the case and well you could argue here it's it's pretty close it's it's all right it's not too bad um, but if this is not the case what we need to use instead is the wilcoxon rank sum test it is sometimes also called man whitney u test and depending on the software package you're using it is also implemented as such and what this does is this is so-called rank transformation so if i look at the songs and i look at the valence these are the values of the valence now some NAs in here but we removed those earlier right um, if i get the ranks for those no, it's not ranks just rank what this does is it takes all the values and just orders them actually we have a nicer way of showing this when we plotted it just up here um, of course you can't see all the values because they're over plotting but these are all our data points and the rank 
It's just, you take all your data points and you don't care about what group it belongs to, if it's major or minor mode, and then you number them from bottom to top. And if two data points have the exact same value, well, then you need to decide what you do. Um, sometimes, depending on the algorithm we're using, we can check this out in the rank algorithm, rank, um, the ties method. What happens when two values are the exact same? Well, we can just um, either put both of them to like a, an average value, or we use the first value or the last, a random one. So by default, um, it uses the average of those. So we take all, all our values and just um, replace each value just with the number in which it occurs in our data set, if ordered by the value. And what this does is it makes our test our data more robust to outliers. Because say we have some numbers, um, 1, 2, uh, 1, 3, 2, 42, 5, and 1000. And I print those, and I also print the rank of those. Notice how even though there's huge differences, like a thousand is quite a, a bit away from those, it is just the rank six. It's just, it's, it's when ordered, it's a six value. So ranks don't care about how huge the differences are. And this is why it's, it's more robust against outliers when we have huge, um, huge differences for a couple of data points in our distribution. Now let's run this. The Wilcox test, we also give it a formula. I believe it should have a formula interface as well. So we want to test the valence. Build D, so valence by or with respect to the mode. And then the data is the songs. And we get a p-value. Notice that this p-value is higher than the first p-value we get here. Here it's point, uh, so it's about 28% for the normal t-test. And for the Wilcoxon test with rank transformation, uh, our p-value is um, about 32%. So the Wilcoxon test, because it does this rank transformation, has a lower statistical power than the t-test, but it is more robust against outliers and also works when your data is not properly normally distributed. There's more settings we need to talk about when we talk about the rank sum test and the t-test. And this is the direction of testing. And we specify this with the keyword alternative. So Let's take our t our t test actually. Let's make it a t test. And now let's use the fake songs. Let's imagine we had we had some data where there was an actual difference, so we do get a statistically significant result. Um, once again, don't do this in practice. Don't just imagine your data, uh, but it's fine to do when you're playing around it, learning this stuff. Um, Per default, the alternative is two-sided, which means our null hypothesis is, well, those just come from the same distribution. Um, how likely is it to get such a, a difference? Um, and then when we talk about the difference we, we are checking, um, we can either say, well, if either of those distributions is higher or lower than the other in, in general, um, we would make this a statistically significant difference. But we can also say beforehand, I have a, an hypothesis, my alternative hypothesis is, for example, that we get higher valence values um, for, um, for a, a mode of one, so and the major code, which would probably be a sensible uh, hypothesis. So, and then we would say, so the alternative would then be greater. 
And in this case, because of the way I assume that the mode is coded, it's exactly the opposite of what we wanted to test. And we get a p-value of one, which is just very high. Um, so we just test it for, for the other thing. And now because our p-value is already super tiny, you can't, you can't see it. But um, the, uh, the p-value where you set an alternative, and this is the thing that's actually happening, um, the p-value will be exactly half of what the two-sided p-value is. Because the two-sided p-value tests for any difference, and the one-sided p-value has a directionality. So we're testing for just one direction. Um, uh, this also means that you can't just first run a two-sided t-test, look at the p-value, and then decide that you somehow had this hypothesis all along that this is going in, in this or this direction, and then run a one-sided t-test. Um, you need to have this hypothesis beforehand, otherwise you're cheating. You're just taking a p-value and, and dividing it by two um, without having this having had this hypothesis beforehand. So um, if you already had this hypothesis, it's fine to use a, a one-sided t-test. Um, if not, um, if you're just testing, is there a difference? And then you want to answer the question, is there a difference? Um, you use a two-sided t-test, but you then can't claim that um, you tested for a difference in one direction or the other. Um, all right, sometimes it can be a bit confusing what way this alternative means in terms of less or more, because we're using this formula input here. Um, and there we need to know what the mode considers to be the first or second group. Um, we could make this more explicit by create, co converting it into a factor ourselves at first. And But another way to do this is we get our, our, vect our raw vectors out first. So we get the... Let's do it like this. The valence for major. Uh, and we take the songs. We filter. Oh, let's actually take the fake songs. For mode being equal to one. And then we pull out the valence. So this gives us just the vector for the valence for major, and then we do the same for minor by just replacing this. And then instead of writing this formula syntax and supplying the data, we are giving it raw, raw vectors using the x and y argument. So valence, uh, let's go minor, and valence major and now it's testing if the minor valence is less than the major valence which gives us a tiny tiny p-value and now it's more obvious to see why here it's less and the other way it's uh, greater and then we would switch these around this would be the same oh there's another thing that t-tests can do for us, and this is give us confidence uh, intervals. So when we're using the t-test um, just with one, one value, so here we are always supplying two things, or a formula that is comparing two things to another. Um, when we just supply one thing, say for example, the valence, and now it gives us um, the mean, which is nice to know, but it also gives us a 70, uh, 95 percent confidence interval. So the confidence interval is based on the assumption of the t-test. Um, the range in which you would assume to find the mean if you ran this same experiment a bunch of times. In 95 percent of cases, you would expect to find the mean of these alternative universes um, where someone else ran this experiment, you would find the mean in this range. Um, 
let's save it to a variable and let's see how we can get this confidence interval out so there is conf int all right so if i run test conf int i can get a vector where the lower one is the lower bound and the second value is the upper bound so this would be the first element for the lower bound and the second ele element would be the upper bound so you could then also use this as error bars in your plot for example it's quite common to plot like a mean and some some confidence interval around this mean all right the next part is a bit out of scope but it's uh, lots of fun um, because i think the data data set lends itself to this sort of fun so um, we want to be talking about pca which stands for principal component analysis and this is a bit of a throwback to when you had um, mathematics at uni mathematics one and two uh, linear algebra but we are doing it in a bit more fun way so bear with me so um the idea, our goal is, because we have so many features, let's look at all these columns. We have 18 columns in total, and all those are features of our data. Every data point is, you can think of every data point as in this multi-dimensional space where every dimension is a feature. And when we are plotting something, usually we're just choosing one or two dim dimension dimensions for the axes, for example, and then we're choosing another dimension, maybe for the color. This is what ggplot is created. at. We are mapping dimensions of our data to some aesthetic properties, um, but we can never really plot all the properties of a point. Maybe we could if we choose some, some more aesthetic properties, like we could use X and Y and color, and maybe give a sound to each, to each point and then adjust the pitch depending on on some some feature but there's really no no way to map all our features into this space so we usually just choosing choosing a couple mm, and then we see how when then we try out different combinations of features to plot uh, for example let's do one here where i'm plotting the energy versus the loudness of our songs and we see Higher energy songs also tend to be louder, or the other way around, louder songs also tend to have a higher energy value. Now, the idea of principal component analysis is now, um, we want to take our features and construct new features from those to represent our data with less features. Um, and we want to do so while losing as little information as possible. In this case, for example, we could say, well, why not make these two just one feature, which is like energy loudness or just energy, because they are so dependent on one another, we are not losing too much information by just compressing it down into one feature. Alison Horst did a really nice illustration and explanation of this by saying, imagine you are a whale shark and we have this swarm of krill, which is conveniently placed in our coordinate system. And then which way do you have to orientate your mouse to get the most amount of krill in one sweep? And this is going to be our first principal component because it explains the most variance in our data, the biggest spread of krill. Now it can be quite hard for humans to imagine being an n-dimensional whale shark. Um, but uh, but fortunately, we have R to help us here. So, all right, I'm back actually with another coffee on another day because the last half of an hour of this recording got screwed up because I took a Zoom meeting in between and apparently that messed with my audio settings in OBS. So now it should be fixed and we're ready to jump into tidy models. Um, the first two things I want to do is recommend two resources. And um, this is the Tidy Models website. You can find both links in the script um, and the very, at the very bottom. And I will make sure to also include one of these cool stickers in the course script that you can just click to get straight to the website. 
And the other thing is uh, the book, Tidy Modeling with R. Um, it is, um, I think it's slow, sort of like the, the R for data science equivalent to tidy models. So while the whole tidyverse thing uh, covers all the data wrangling and plotting, tidy models covers all the all your modeling needs from statistics to advanced machine learning as well. So um, this is a really good read as well by Max Kuhl and Julia Silgi. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's jump right in. And today we're actually not going to use tidy models to its full potential because it has so much to offer, but we're actually only going to do part of what your normal workflow with tidy models would be because usually you do tidy models and modeling to make some sort of prediction. So we are taking some data, we're taking all our features in our data, and then we're using these to predict something else. Um, for example, one of, one of the examples on the tidy models website, I think, is to predict the housing prices based on, on some features like location. Um, but today uh, we are not going to make any predictions. We're just looking at our features and trying to get a better understanding of those features. So the first thing we need to do when we come into tidy models is create a recipe to pre-process our data. And we do this with the function recipe. Oh, and actually, because I restarted everything, I need to rerun my code, of course. So let's run all code chunks above, take another sip of coffee. And while this runs, you can also make the help panel visible again. And now we should be here. So now it recognizes recipe is from the tidy models or the recipes package, which is part of tidy models. And now we can open it up and recipe takes the two most important things, which is the data and a formula. Normally we put the formula up here first. So all the formulas, they have this tilde syntax, the squiggly lines. Um, and then the second argument is data which I believe I called songs. Now we need to put some formula. Normally, if we want to predict something, we say whatever we want to predict, and this is our outcome variable. Um, and let's quickly look back into our songs. Say we wanted to predict the, the danceability of a song based on, based on the energy and the speechiness and the acousticness. So based on a bunch of features, and then we could try to make a predictive model that given the values for energy, speechiness and acousticness, it predicts how danceable this song would be. Um, in our case, I want to do something different. I want to replace this with a dot and the dot means get all of our features, everything, all columns of our data frame. Even those in the beginning, but we'll, we will deal with those in a second. Um, and then we don't want to predict anything. We just want, we just want to pre-process pre our data. We don't want to make any predictions. We want to just transform our features and um, do some feature generation. Um, next, let's let's just show you how this looks like. We get a recipe with no inputs, and we get data frame, which tells us what the recipe contains. There's right now 18 predictors. So on the right side of this thing, we see the predictors. Um, however, note that if we look at these songs, we don't really want to use the track name and the track artist. And also, if I recall correctly, I added the Spotify UI. Um, we don't want to use those as predictors because, well, if you know the name of a song, it's easy to predict something about the song. And right? this would be cheating in a way and this would mean the program would just try to memorize all songs so we want to update the roles and now we need to give it a bunch of columns or of features of our data so our track name we want track artists um, 
And then I don't recall how I called the uh, track UI. Okay. And now it says our concepts are columns that don't exist. I forgot to tell it. Firstly, it's multiple artists. And second, we need to tell it the new role it should get. So the new role should be, I believe, and for this, let's just open up the help page. So the old role is assumed to assume to be predictor and the new role ID variable. I'm sure in these, in the tidy models documentation, there's a list of all those roles that can be there. Right now we only have 15 predictors and three identi three identifying variables. Next up is what I want to do is step normalize. So the recipe has maybe some update step and then a bunch of steps. And all these steps start with step, step underscore, which is nice. So step normalize. Um, and then there are some helper functions to select variables, just like in tidy select. Um, there's a helper function called all predictors, which just get, gives us all predictors. Um, and now we see we are centering and scaling for all predictors. And this means it takes all the values that the predictors, the individual predictors can have and makes sure they are between zero and one usually. And this um, makes sure that no single predictor can have like a massive influence just because it has really large numbers. For example, the track duration in millisecond, it's of course uh, larger numbers than the track popularity, which goes from, I guess, zero to a hundred. Um, so if you just were to fit a model, it would just um, have a huge influence from the track duration. But if we center and scale it, they both have equal chances to influence our, our our predictions. So next up, I want to say step PCA. And what the PCA does is it takes all our features and generates new features of those, those so-called principal components, which try to explain the most variance of our data. And every single principal component will be a linear combination of all of our features. Uh, you, you probably know this from um, linear alg algebra that you had in, in the first and second semester in math where you created a new vector space and uh, we, you transformed the origin of a vector space, for example. So this is essentially the same thing, except we don't have to do the math, which I like. <clears throat> so this is our recipe and oh, we need to tell it that we want all predictors in the PCA and let's save this as, a, as our recipe. Let's leave this up here so we can see it later on in the script. Now, next up, what we want to do is take this recipe and prepare it. So, um, let's call it song prep. So we call the function prep to prepare the songs recipe. So right now the recipe didn't do anything, didn't calculate any, anything. It just told, tell, tells us what it would do if we asked it to do something. And now we're actually asking it to prepare the recipe. And we're getting an error here. Infinite or missing values in SVD. So this is the centering and scaling algorithm. I assume we are using and normalizing. Um, no, SVD is singular value decomposition. So it's happening in the principal component step. And the reason this is failing is because of course, we have some missing missing values. So we have two options here. Um, either we take our songs and remove all the missing values um, or all the rows where some features have missing values and then use this as data. Or we make this an additional step in our data pre-processing. Let me show you how this is done first. And then we talk about why this is cool. Hmm. We leave the step missing, step NA, NA omit. Yeah, step NA omit. Uh, 
And I believe we just do this for all predictors. So now we change our recipe again. And now it's ready to be prepared. Okay. Um, let's talk about why we're doing this as a step and not just to our whole data set. Now in this case, honestly, it doesn't really matter. But um, if we are doing this in a larger statistics or machine learning project, um, what we often have is we have our training data set that we're using to train a model to make predictions. And then we have some some data we call the test set which we are not allowing the model to see because otherwise the model could just try and cheat and um, and memorize all the values or and answers for example and then we don't have anything left to actually test our model with so we wouldn't get an honest evaluation of how it would perform in the wild it's actually similar to a student just memorizing a, a test and then just writing down the test result um, because they memorize the answers to a test and then noted the test beforehand. Um, if you don't have new new questions afterwards, um, you have no way of knowing how they generalize on other tests. So, and because we're doing this as a recipe, if we now had different data sets, we could create our recipe for our training data, prepare our recipe for our training data, and then um, apply the same recipe to our testing data, for example. So then um, our testing data would also get its uh, NAs removed and would also get normalized and would also get turned into principal components. So this is the advantage of having everything in the recipe. Um, apart from just looking very clean and neat. All right, now we pre prepared the recipe. And what this did is, did is it actually performed these cal cal calculations here. So if you look here, it says... Um, our training data contained 393 data points. We got 24 incomplete rows, but we removed those, removing rows with NA values. Um, and then we did centering and scaling. And then we extracted principal components from our features. Now, the last step we need to do um, because this is now a prepared recipe, it knows how to handle our data. We need to treat our data with this recipe. So um, let's call it songs baked, because uh, the function to do that is actually bake. So bake takes a recipe and also takes the data. And as the data, we're just using our novel songs data. And this now took our data and transformed it into this principal component space. So all our features got replaced with the principal components, which are linear combinations of our features. And we will visualize those in a minute. But first, let's look at the individual features contributions to each principal component. And for this, let me actually do this up here because no, I think it makes sense to do it down here. Okay. And for this, we need the prepared recipe. And we want to explore this a bit. And we want to explore this with the function tidy. Because tidy from the yardstick package um, can give us a tidy representation of a, an individual processing step. So tidy of the songs recipe, we are getting all these steps. And the step we are caring about right now is the principal component step. However, well, we can right now get all the data by identifying it with a number. I think it's often easier to give it an ID so in each step, we can say what's the ID of this step. And this makes sure that when we later add more steps, and or maybe the order of steps changes, our code doesn't break. And I like it when our code doesn't break. And now we can get uh, the PCA step. 
Let's see. Here it tells us the ID. Now we can get the PCA step by its ID. And now we get the individual contributions of each component um, of each term, which is our, our original features to each principal component. <clears throat> so let's um, tidy this up a bit. I want to actually make the component column um, a just a number. And the pass number function is actually really good. Just ignoring the test the text around it. And let's now call this a uh, terms maybe. And we can visualize those terms. Um, first, let me check how many components do we have. We have 15 in total. So in step PCA, we could have specified how many components we want. By default, I apparently just does 15. Um, usually they get less and less, right? Always, they get less and less important as we go along. The first principal component will always be the one x that explains the most variance in our data. So um, looking at the 15 is not going, going to result in any insights for us, I assume. Um, so before we do this, let's just look at the first three, I think. So now what I want to plot is on the x-axis, I want to plot the value. On the y-axis, I want to plot the term. And then I want a geom all. And I want to facet wrap this by component. Now term is not found and this is, I keep forgetting plurals in this recording. So now I want to also make sure that the label is label both. Yeah, this one. Now we see component one, component two, component three. What I also like to do is order things. Now this can be a bit tricky here because Remember that if you just had things on one axis, we could use the factor reorder function to just turn it into a factor and reorder it by something. So here we would do a factor reorder terms and then reorder terms by value. Um, but now we have these individual, we have these um, individual facets. And if we reorder those, well, the order inside of those um, will not be the same. Um, for example, in component two, the largest negative compute contribution is from track year. Um, but in track one, uh, track year is really unimportant. So those would be ordered differently. And if we want to allow for this, we need to cheat a bit. Um, there's actually a function from the tidy text package, which deals with text processing. Um, which I believe is by David Robinson and Julia Silge, um, um, who also wrote a book on text processing. And if you are into natural language processing, that's probably a very good read. Um, and the they have a like, little helper function that has nothing to do with text data, but I assume they did a lot of these visualizations. So they created a helper function, which we can use as well. So um, inside of mutate, I want to say that terms is equal to um, tidy text to reorder within. So in reorder within, we can reorder the terms and then we can say by what we want to order by value within, within the component. So this will reorder the bath just within each one. But this alone is not enough. We need to also tell ggplot about this because it's, they are creating some 
sort of fake terms to make sure this reordering works. So um, inside of tidy text, we have the scale y reordered function. So these go hand in hand. And now in the facets, we need to make sure we allow three scales. Now we are allowing the order of things to change within each scale and it looks much nicer. So one last thing I want to do is highlight if a bar goes into the positive or negative direction. So in order to do that, let's take the fill color and make it depend on um, a categorical version of the sign. So in minus one or plus one, depending on the direction the term the value goes All right, and what we don't actually need is the legend for the color. So guide. No guide for the fill. All right, this is looking better. And now we can see the individual contributions of each term to the components. So remember, the first principal component is always some linear combination of features that explains the most variance in our data. We will calculate later on how much of the variance it explained. Um, and well, in the positive direction, we have acousticness. In the negative direction, we have loudness. So things that are high up on the first principal component will have a high acousticness and a low loudness. Um, and a high instrumentalness and low energy. So we are probably use, looking at the classical music there. So let's verify this because, um, well, it's very, very acoustic. Um, let's take whatever what we did earlier. So these are just the terms. And, ah, yeah, we need to look at the baked songs now because these are now our songs transformed into this principal component space. So we can look at the individual tracks. And now while I plotted three components here and we could have gone more, it's usually hard to plot more than two dimensions, especially on a Cartesian grid. So let's just visualize the first two. So on the X axis, I just want PC1. On the Y axis, I want PC2. And then we scale. No scaling yet. <laughs> First, we need a GM point. And this is already it. Yeah. It's a very short plot. Let's save this to a variable. And because we can't see the song names here and this would be really hard to see if we plotted all the song names. So let's take the plotly package for this one. And I think this is for where well, it's really, really useful. And in uh, the geom point, we give it a, this hidden aesthetic called text, which is actually only used by plotly. It's not displayed anywhere, but this should be the combination of the track artists. Um, and and the track name. How are we going to write this? Let's uh, separate this by a comma. Um, let's pull this one up here as well. So 
Um, like we already discovered earlier, on the first principal component, we got some high acousticness and low loudness. So what are these um, high acoustic and low loudness songs? We've got The Princess Appears, John Williams. This is from the Star Wars soundtrack. And we got um, Art Vorjak's second, um, second, what's it called in the symphony, the parts of the symphony in English? I don't know. I don't actually know. Um, or don't recall. So it's uh, from the Ninth Symphony for, from the New World, which is a really, really great symphony. Um, but the second one is very, very slow um, um, and quiet. Uh, the other part should be faster. Yeah, Adagio, for example, the first one. And the third one, it's uh, they're way faster. Um, which is why they are more towards the left because the right means lower energy. F, what's, what do we have with higher energy? It's familiar from the Spider-Man, the uh, Spider-Verse soundtrack. It's a great one. Um, Dear Future Self, it's up followed by, ah, followed by, yeah, Fire AM Green Day. Um, we got Beyonce here, <laughs> Edra Lavigne. So all, our enemy is from the new Arcane League of Legends series um, by Imagine Dragons, the song. Also very high in energy. And now what do we have on the other component? Um, on the second component, we got in the positive direction, so up, it's the valence positive. And the higher it goes up, um, the track here seems to also be important. So um, higher up on the second component means there's negative contribution from the track here. So it's earlier years up top and later years down low. So yeah, bridges by rise against pretty new one compared to uh, Toto by Africa. So this makes sense. Um, apparently, um, Toto scored maybe a bit better on the danceability scale and the popularity as well. Um, so yeah, these are the new ones by Rise Against. And we got Game of Thrones here in the middle. Life on Mars. So yeah, these David Bowie. So these these are definitely the older songs down here. Pink Floyd and another brick in the wall. So the second principal component seems to, if you see, there's a large contribution by the track here. So this uh, sorts of songs by recency in a way. But it's of of course it's mixed with all the other features with varying contributions. And the third component we haven't plotted here. <coughs> we could actually look at that right now. Let's look at the. Second versus third. So I'm not going to put this in the script, but this is a nice bonus view if you're watching the, the lecture as a video. So second compound, once again, it's recency. So old songs now on the right. Africa, Toto, yeah. My Sharon of the Neck. Um, the Who, yeah. Um, and then rise against on the left. Uh, and now on the third principal component, we have a the mode actually. So major songs would be up here and minor songs down here. 21 piles, lots of major minor songs, Wild Heart, Mother the Sons, Cornfield Chase, Barnes Zimmer. It's from Interstellar, I believe. Panic at the Disco and oh, Chlorine is down here. Um, and the key, uh, this is something we should probably have changed because there's no natural ordering in the keys um, that would make sense to have it on on this color, um, not color, on this um, number scale. Um, because it just mapped, like for example, C major would be, I guess, the key one with mode one. Um, and then I guess um, I guess this would be the second second key. Um, but so it would have made sense to maybe not put this into our principal component space or transform it into a categorical variable first. Um, but um, that's all I have for the. Oh, I haven't actually. Um, we need to talk about the explained variants. So how much of the variance in our data does each component explain? And for this, 
I need to look at the prepared recipe again. Uh, the third step of our prepared recipe is the PCA. So we can actually get all these steps and then get the third element. So this is everything there is to know about our principal component. And I just know that there is a, a res option here, or an element of this list called res, which is the standard deviation. of each principal component. And from this, we just want the SDEF. Uh, so rest is would be, I guess, the results, and then SDEF is the standard deviation. And now we can take these, let's call these SDEF. Uh, we can take those and square them and divide them by the sum of squares. And this is the explained variation. And now we can put this in a table. And let's actually do this just in here. And then we replace the assignments with equal signs here. And make sure we have a comma back here. Now we have this in a nice table. And we can use this um, very, let's call it variance. Now we can use this in ggplot. We actually want to plot, let's give us one. We need the num the name of the component, the number of the components as well. So, um, Let's call the PC one to number of values that we have, which oh, doesn't work in here. Okay. Length, so length of SDF. This should work. And now we can actually plot it. So let's plot the PC on the X axis. On, on the Y axis, we plot the explained variance. Use the geom call. Let's add a geom text as well with a vertical adjustment of one point something and a color of white. Let's make those. And now this one we need to actually format a bit. and format and like this this is actually an interesting syntax to explain here um, we're using it on the y-axis as well scale y continuous um, we want the labels to be Scales percent format. And before we look at the explained variance, let me quickly explain why there is actually true um, parentheses before we actually passing something to this function. And this is because scales percent format is not just a normal function, it is what we call a function factory. So it is a function that returns a function. And this is handy because in scale y continuous, for example, labels can take a function that transforms our values into something more readable. However, there's multiple ways of making a function to convert something from a, from a number, a point something, to, to a percent. And this is why scales percent format gives us a function factory to create one of those functions. So we can give it more options and then we just return a different function. If we, if we run just this part, it tells us this is a function 
which just takes a number and just and returns the the thing. So this actual thing would be a function that returns a function. And in here in label in GM text, I just wanted to just transform it straight away. So I create the function with the function factory and then I call this function. In here, in scale while continuous, I create this function and just pass it to the label argument, which then applies it to all the labels. And yeah, now, now we see that the first principal component actually explains 26% um, of all the variants in, in the data, or of all the variants that is explained by our principal components. And the second one only explains 11.2%. So the first one is always the most important one. And oh, I should change this around so that when you're reading the script, we're seeing the most important stuff first. And then you can, of course, play around with it later on if you want. And you get plenty of opportunity because in the in the exercises, I also give you another data set with Spotify data, which has some more interesting information, like what playlist it came from, which comes from the Tidy Tuesday project, which presents a cool data set every Tuesday. So if you want to practice some more, definitely also check out the Tidy Tuesday project, which um, I have used a bunch of data sets before in the other exercises. I just wanted to highlight it here. And this is all I have for you today, and I'll see you in the seminar.